series of knock-on effects which, which lead up to forcing of descending motion in the middle attitudes, and it's the descending motion which, which creates the drag. Okay, so that was it. And there are about five papers about that if you want to, if you want to read them. So um, looking again at, to amplify this point of how the, the droughts in North America are linked into global hydroclimate, this is just observations over land. The dots are rain gauge records. Brown is dry and green is wet. So this is the dust. This is the 1930s. There's the dust bowl. And over the, o over the oceans, these are observations of sea surface temperature. Here's the persistent La Nina. This is the one where there was a severe drought in the southwest in the 1950s. Again, it's a La Nina. This is the most recent one, the period from 1998 to 2003, although that drought has not yet ended yet. Here it is in the southwest. Again, it was a persistent La Nina. And then the three that we can look at, the three that did occur in the, in the 19th century, basically no rain gauge data there, but we can get it from the tree rings. Each one of these was, was, went along with a soaring. Here it is. Each one of these, I'll try to stop doing that. Each one of these went along with a cold tropical um, Pacific. And much of, much of the, um, going back one, much of the, the global hydroclimate um, rearrangement during the droughts is reproduced as well. And please note that when it is dry here, it also tends to be dry in um, northern Argentina, Uruguay, southern Brazil at the same time. As you would expect if these droughts are being forced into tropics, the pattern is, has a great de degree of hemispheric symmetry in the, in, in the Americas and elsewhere too. And I'm, while waiting for this to start this, there are a load of discarded books across the, in the room across the way, and there's one about the economic history of Argentina, and I thought I'd quickly look up drought, and it talks about declining productivity of rangelands and drought in Argentina in the 1930s and 1950s. They, they did have equipment, not as severe as North America, but they did have severe droughts at exactly the same time as North, as North America did. As you would expect, the tropical Pacific, which is in between the two areas, was the driving for the hydroclimate of rearrangement. Okay, so we saw that. This is actually a picture of a dust storm. This is a photograph of a dust storm that occurred during the 1890s drought, and this is the first picture of a dust storm in America um, that I could find. Here's the dust storm approaching a town in, in 1894. At this time, the agriculture in the region was purely um, cattle, so this is not due to development of wheat cropping, which is what happened in the dust bowl and the wheat just died and exposed the surface. This, is, this dust storm is resulting from, from overgrazing. The, the, they should have had a less, the, the lesson should have been learned about the risk of this kind of thing as agriculture develops, but of course that lesson wasn't known. Um, it does turn out that the tropical Atlantic does play um, a secondary role, again, for the tropical, um, for, for the dust bowl drought. This is the observed change in precipitation during the 30s. Global SST forcing, you've already seen, the one with tropical Pacific SST forcing. The tropical Atlantic SST forcing alone, you also get a drying. So the 30s drought and it turns out the 50s drought were both droughts where the Pacific and the Atlantic came into arrangement to both um, induced drying over North America. Not true of the 19th century droughts, but there is a, there is a role for, for, the, for the Atlantic. Now, turning to the longer period before we get to the future, and this will amplify some of the things that, and correct some of the things that Wally said, but um, the, the best records of the, of the hydroclimate of North America come from tree rings. And the tree ring records that have been developed largely at Le Mans by um, Ed Cook um, come from living trees, because there are trees that live in the West going back several hundred, even several thousand years. And this is entirely from, from living trees. And what he has, um, and it's with annual resolution. So you have a map of summer drought severity every single year going back to 2 AD. From 800 AD on, the maps cover most of North America, including some parts of Canada and some parts of, of northern Mexico. And what Cook um, has shown here is the percent of the American West that is experiencing moderate to severe droughts. And we're over here in 2000. This is 800 AD. 
to 1300 and something, there was this period of elevated aridity, which basically is like a dust bowl level severity drought, but which was going on, on and off, but mostly on for several hundred years during the medieval period. And those are some more of the photographs of the relic tree stumps that were growing because the rivers weren't flowing at, at that time. And if this is some maps, first of all, for the mob, from tree ring records of the drought severity during some of these modern day droughts, the Civil War drought, the 1890s drought, Dust Bowl, 1950s. Um, the map of the, the, you see the characteristic pattern we've seen again, and this is the, the drought severity, never mind the units, but the drought severity year by year through, through, through the drought, which is averaged over the West. Now, if we, go, we can make maps like this for the medieval droughts as well, and the first thing to notice is that the, is that the, the pattern of the medieval droughts is very similar to the modern day droughts, but notice that these ones, instead of going on for 10 years, this one in the 12th century went on for 40 years, others went on for 30 years, and you have the, the axis is the same as for the modern day droughts, so the, the severity in any one year is comparable to, say, the dust bowl of the 1950s. The difference is that during the medieval period, that kind of severity of drought didn't just go on for a decade, but went on for many decades of time and then one after the other with very few, um, in, with very few interruptions. It, it is, well, I'll get to that. Um, it does turn out that we've looked at some 20-something or 30 hydroclimate records from around the world, and we find that, um, looking at the medieval records, that there is evidence of drought in South America at the same time as in North America, and many other of the global features we see associated with modern-day droughts do appear in the medieval period. And there is one record of coal from corals of the sea surface temperature in the tropical Pacific at that time which suggested it was coal. So our leading hypothesis right now is that the medieval mega droughts were being forced by tropical Pacific sea surface temperatures. And this is a map of which we reconstructed from a coral record of what the SST was like in the tropical Pacific, cold by a fraction of a degree during one of these, one of these uh, mega droughts, and this is the history of the SST during that mega drought. So to the extent that we can tell, it seems that they were being, it was basically a persistent-like state, of La Nina-like state during the medieval periods. Now, these, had, these droughts had a significant impact on the people who were living there at the time. This is one of those magnificent um, towns. This is um, either Chaco, I think this is Chaco Canyon, it's definitely in a canyon, isn't it? And uh, these were inhabited for decades by ancestral Pueblo, Puebloan Indians in these apartment dwellings over, over here. And I was always curious about this because, you know, they, the time when these were inhabited was a time during this medieval drought. So, you know, these are irrigation-based societies. All their farming was from irrigation. How did, they, how did they manage to do that? And then at some point in the 14th, by the 14th century, all of, these, all of these towns had been abandoned, which happened to coincide with the end of the medieval, me end of the medieval mega droughts. But when you actually look at the, the fine texture of the of the occupation and development of these towns, you find there's a very good relationship to drought. And the, the, the bars here are the number of habitation sites in the Four Corners area as a function of calendar year. And it went up and it went down and it went up and it went down. And the boxes here, when it went down, do coincide with tree ring evidence of, of some of these severe mega droughts coming in. So, for example, during this period in the 12th, in the 13th century, there was a huge population growth in this region over a period of several decades, about 70, 80 years, which came on the heels of a mega drought and was terminated by a mega drought. So when it got enough wet enough, the, the Indians built like crazy and built these tremendous towns. They, of course, knew that there were such things as mega droughts, but they probably just assumed that, you know, they had now gone away and that they could, they could, you know, just carry on. 
and then they were rudely awakened when one of these droughts um, came back.